Um, so uh, thank you again for the uh, opportunity to come in and be part of this forum. I want to talk today a little bit about um, some work that uh, I and some colleagues have been doing at UC uh, San Diego and also University of San Diego on really centering the environmental impact of computing in both computer science teaching and research. If you think about it, our lives are increasingly online and that's never been more true than during the COVID pandemic from entertainment, business, shopping, media, um, all of the aspects of our typical life are intertwined uh, with the internet. And if you think about it, I want you to stop and think for a second about just how much online services have changed over the last 20 years or so. So perhaps you were a beta user of Google in 1998, and this is what the website looked like. Uh, this is the 2002 version of the Netflix website. Now, the only thing you could do on this website is sign up for the service. You couldn't stream any movies because they were mailed to you. And I've talked to undergraduates in my class, and they thought I was joking when I said that, but it's true. This is Twitter. If you want to look at YouTube in 2004, you're kind of out of luck because it wasn't actually invented until 2005. Uh, and as you can see here at the bottom, the view counts for their featured videos are in the dozens, not the dozens of millions. So a big scale issue there. And of course, uh, you could only be part of the Facebook if you were at Harvard University. So the network has really seen this rapid growth. So the web was created in 1989. The first graphical web browser was 1993. Google's entire global technology infrastructure fit underneath a card table at Stanford University in 1996. And you know, uh, Facebook was developed a little bit later. And so this enormous growth has had to occur in a very short period of time. There has been a relentless focus on scalability. The providers have had to deliver increasingly complex applications to billions of people in the world in just a couple of years. And people like us, end users, in order to participate in this, have had to purchase a series of increasingly complex devices, smartphones, tablets, laptops, desktops, et cetera. And there's a pace of innovation has been absolutely relentless. So this talk is really about the environmental impact of this rapid growth on the way that we teach students about computer science and on the way we design and we, and we build these network uh, systems. So one question you might ask is sort of what is computer science? And you can answer that by saying computer science is the set of things that we teach to computer science undergraduates. That as a faculty, we have decided that this set of topics is what computer science is and what it means. If you ask sort of faculty or students, you'll say what a degree does is to give students the understanding from the very basics of the field all the way up to these high level applications. So we start by teaching students Boolean logic, the rules by which ones and zeros can be combined in logical operators called gates. Gates like and, nor, et cetera, uh, are, are based on this Boolean logic. Using those gates, you can start building arithmetic circuits. So this is a circuit that adds two bits together. Once you start uh, building upon these circuits, you can start building more complicated processors. So this is a very simple design of a central processor unit, a CPU. Students take classes, sort of bringing them through these layers of abstraction. They start learning about how to program these machines in low level machine language and assembly language, then into higher level languages that allow them uh, to write more complex programs with fewer lines of code. They start organizing information into, uh, excuse me, uh, start organizing information into a variety of data structures and algorithms that allow um, the, you know, being able to piece together information, being able to organize it, sort it, uh, filter it, and things like that. And then eventually we have a series of graduate and upper division courses focusing on new areas of computing. So things like computer vision. How do you take a photograph and extract meaningful semantic information from that? This is something that's a very important topic and our students are very interested in. Things like nat natural language processing. Um, if you say, uh, you know, how do you talk to your phone and to ask it for directions? This is this is technology that people are, are interested in. So the modern computer science graduate has an end-to-end -end understanding from basic logic up to all of these exciting new applications. So that's what you would say. Is we, we cover the whole gamut from the, from the ground floor to the top. And I think defining something that I've noticed, so I'm a, I'm a computer systems builder. My research is on building networks and building network software and computer systems. And so, you know, 
when you think about what we, where we define the starting line of our field and where we define the finishing line is really important. And so I, I was actually kind of thinking a lot about this uh, sort of a chart. I had a picture like this in elementary school on the wall of the school, and it shows the electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, stick with me because this connects to the topic. And you know, it shows you that there is radio waves and microwaves and ultraviolet and infrared and X-ray and all of these things. This is 16 orders of magnitude in terms of frequency ranges. But it's really only this narrow part in the middle, the visible spectrum that defines what we see, what we experience. And so that, that kind of defines our experience of the spectrum. So in a lot of ways, one of the things that I've really been thinking about a lot and talking with, with some of my colleagues, both here at UCSD and in the field, um, has been that at least in terms of CS education research, we tend to gravitate towards a visible spectrum that sort of begins on, on uh, this, this layer, this abstraction, and it sort of ends at these exciting applications. And what happens kind of before those abstractions or after those applications are finished is a little bit left as a, as a not part of our, our program. And I think it's important that we center our, center our thoughts on that. So if you ask students, okay, well, where do these gates come from? How do they execute? They'll usually say, well, you, you execute on a CPU. And yeah, CPU, okay, well, where do those come from? And they'll usually say, well, there's these people, they wear these funny outfits and they hold these disks up. I think that has something to do with that and anything before that. And then it's sort of like a chemist's problem or a physicist's problem or something like that. And so it gets kind of very vague. On the other side, and you say, well, okay, once these cool applications, smartphone applications, mobile applications, once we are done using them, once we've turned that computer off for the last time, what happens to those devices? And people say, oh, you take it to the e-waste recycling center, which is a great idea. And I highly recommend doing that. Don't throw it in the garbage, put it in the e-waste recycling. But then what happens at that point? And that's sort of, again, one of the limits of this visible spectrum. And so, um, you know, these dual questions, I think, are important to begin asking as we scale systems to a scale they've never been before. As we start building computer systems and networks that can support billions of users, I think it's important that we take a step back and ask, when it comes to teaching computer science, this digital logic executes on physical hardware. Where does that hardware come from? Who are the people, the places, the land, and the journey from raw materials to what you use in a course project, for example, or what you use in your personal life? And what happens to all of those resources, that physical material, after that computer is switched off for the last time? On the research side, when we, when we build new computer systems, can we scale our compute infrastructure to meet the planetary compute needs in a way that's sustainable? I think these are the kind of tool, dual questions that um, I think are important to begin addressing as we're at this inflection point. And so I was really um, um, honored to be invited to come to talk today. In part, uh, uh, George Hightower and I uh, connected over a course that I, I taught at um, UC San Diego in the spring of 2021. Uh, called The Environmental Impact of Modern Computing. That course is going to be taught next quarter as well at the graduate level. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that and then spend a couple minutes talking a little bit about the role that CS networking research can play in reducing this impact. And I want to point out that this course was also in conversation with um, a course at U University of San Diego that will be the focus of the April Ethics Forum talk. So please come and attend that. So CS190, the Environmental Impact of Modern Computing, in this class, we take a critical look at the 360 degree impact of modern computing technologies on the environment. And I started by asking the following question. So this is a part of our syllabus. Where do these devices come from? What's the impact of their manufacturing on the local environment and the community? How are they powered? What are their energy demands and where does that energy come from? What's the cloud? What are the energy implications of cloud computing? Where do these devices go when we're done using them? What is e-waste? What is the circular economy? And what's the role of public policy and governments in managing and mitigating these environmental effects? How do we communicate issues related to environmental impacts to the public? And I think uh, the last point is, what can you as a student do now to help address the environmental impact of modern computing? I think in today's forum and in April's forum, that's going to be something that will um, be a commonality. Because when you talk about things like climate change, carbon um, uh, footprints of things, it can bring students into a very demoralized place. 
And I think it's important to stress that we are building this technology. We're training these computer scientists. We're educating these computer scientists to, and, and people in other fields as well, to go out into the world. And I think that we have responsibility to think about some of these issues. And I want to point out that I'm certainly not the first person who's talked about the environmental impact of computing. Um, but I do think that, and, and even at UC San Diego, in a variety of our courses, these topics do appear at different places in our curriculum. But I think that this is, um, to my knowledge, one of the first courses, at least here, that tries to really put a focus on them all in a single course. The course was structured as a, a quarter system. So we have a 10 week course and um, it was structured as a series of topics that were covered. Um, and then students submitted group research project proposals. Those proposals were reviewed, feedback was provided. And then throughout the sort of second five weeks of the course, students put together their own uh, research project papers. And that culminated in a workshop where um, uh, the post, there was a poster session where students were able to present this work um, during the COVID pandemic, this was all done virtually because um, this was in the spring of 2021 and everything was fully online. We began with several resources. So we started with Bill Gates's brand new book, which was How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, which gave students um, a, a sense of the carbon issue. So it talks about carbon and it talks about um, uh, giving students some grounding for a lay audience on some of the topics related to climate change. We looked at Tom Murphy, who's a CS, excuse me, my cat has uh, taken a, to join the panel, I guess, join the forum. Um, uh, Tom Murphy was a, is a UCSD professor who wrote this great book on some of the limitations of physical resources uh, in, in our society, in our climate. And we have a, a guide on practical sustainable IT equipment. Information and computing technology, ICT, um, accounts for about 1.4% uh, of the 51 billion tons of carbon put into the environment each year, and about 3.6% of global energy demand. And you may say, well, that doesn't seem like a lot. It's a couple of percent. It is higher than the airline industry, for example. And the, the key point is that it's growing very fast. Several drivers like machine learning, artificial intelligence, and other big data applications are really driving the planetary demand for compute significantly higher. The velocity is increasing. And so unless we find ways to design and build systems that are resilient or that, that don't continue to increase, um, this will become an, a, an even larger problem. So where do these devices come from? What's the impact of their manufacturing on the local environment and, commun and uh, uh, communities? So this is a periodic table of the elements that highlights the elements that are typically involved in building smartphones, laptops, desktops, and other ICT types of equipment. And you can see that um, there's a variety of these elements that are needed to come together in a global supply chain in order to make these chips, in order to manufacture these chips. If you followed the news recently, you know that chip shortages are responsible for things like cars being expensive. Part of that issue is that the supply chain for producing modern microprocessors is extremely complicated, and it involves touching parts of almost all of the world's resources and bringing them together. So we talked a little bit about uh, this particular issue. We talked about the effect of mining on different communities. So this is mining for elements that go into LCD screens and printed circuit boards. Uh, this is coltan, which is used to make uh, uh, capacitors that are part of smartphones today. And, um, and so we looked at some of this mining. For that, we actually relied on a multi-series, ar uh, a multiple article series from the Washington Post in 2016 that did a deep dive on how lithium ion batteries come to existence. And so we, we kind of went through those um, and these are some photos from those articles, each one doing a deep dive in this particular case in graphite, which is used to make lithium ion batteries, the effect that graphite mines have on communities, almost entirely all of the lithium ion battery carb, uh, graphite comes from a region of China. Uh, the near Chile, there's an indigenous community that supplies lithium that is part of the batteries. And um, so we, you know, we, we did a deep dive on that as well. Interestingly, several billion dollars worth of lithium is extracted from this region 
every year. And the indigenous people there were offered $150,000 for a 25 year mining license. So clearly there's some very uh, disturbing and very tragic historical parallels there to, to um, that, that are not lost on our, on our community. Cobalt is mined in the Congo. And again, that's used to make batteries and it's almost entirely done by hand often with children involved in the mining process as well. So trying to understand, you know, a little bit about that. And, and again, part of the, the motivation for that is not just to educate ourselves about where the physicality of something that's very sleek and, and exciting comes from, but also to drive awareness that these physical resources are not free and they do not just magically appear. And so part of the tension that this brings up in class is that in, an, in our other parts of our curriculum, we talk about how important it is to build faster processors, more processors, more cores, more RAM, better graphics and stuff like that. And I think some of our students had the experience of saying, now, wait a minute, what if we could find ways to keep existing devices in use longer? Is there a way we can reconfigure components so that they could have a longer usable lifespan so that we can um, not require such a large intake of minerals into this global supply chain. We also looked at how these devices are powered, where their energy demands from uh, demands are and where they come from. So this is a picture of the distribution grid, the energy grid. And it's a very complicated picture. And there's a lot of components on it. I'm not going to go into the details. Um, but one of the things that we are living in right now is a transformation of this grid from a very static 100-year-old um, sort of grid from, from that has been developed over time to really an energy network where you have producers that are distributed through things like rooftop solar, solar, geothermal, other types of renewable energies, and then you have consumers of that energy. And so the rapid deployment of clean energy technologies is exciting, but it also produces or it, it introduces a number of technical challenges for how to match this intermittent clean energy with demand that exists over time. And so this process of trying to move the energy to where the demand is, or maybe move the demand to where the energy is, is an open problem and one that's driving a lot of the way people build systems. We had a guest lecture from a representative from California ISO, which is the grid uh, that operates uh, California's energy grid in a small part of Nevada. And um, so they came in and gave a presentation for exactly how this work works, how the market works, how do they, uh, adapt to things like clean energy and how does that fit into a grid that has a lot of different consumers. We talked about the cloud, the energy implications of cloud computing. So smartphones, laptops, these kind of end devices we've been talking about are designed to be very energy efficient. They have uh, highly efficient battery technologies. And so you might say, well, my phone doesn't use up a lot of energy. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's very efficient. But in reality, the phone is only the window into the internet that we use. It is the cloud that requires that to actually work. If you post on Instagram and it doesn't leave your phone, did you really, does it really count? You know, that kind of thing. And so what we really wanna understand is what ex exactly is the cloud and, and what are the energy implications of that? The cloud is compute, it's disk and file storage, networking, graphics processing, machine learning, artificial intelligence, everything that makes these apps function and work together. These are very large facilities. These are some pictures of Google's data centers, Microsoft's Facebook data centers. These are very large warehouse scale buildings containing hundreds of thousands of servers, networking equipment, storage devices, et cetera. And each of these large scale providers has dozens to hundreds of these data centers spread around the world. And they're a huge source of, um, of energy. This is the cooling, the cooling equipment required to keep all of that equipment cold. Uh, this is Facebook's networking gear. Um, so you can see that uh, this is actually a, a, a machine learning cluster that is used at Google to train machine learning models for things like uh, natural language processing. So you can see the enormous energy demands involved in building this, these systems. For this, we used a resource, which is a book called The Data Center as a Computer, Designing Warehouse Scale Machines, which is by three Google authors talking about how their data centers worked. Again, this is a huge source of um, carbon energy footprint, about 1% to 2% of global energy consumption, uh, 140 billion kilowatt hours and 100 metric tons of carbon. And this is actually a picture from Google on how much energy they, they use. It's, 
it's showing that they're increasingly relying on uh, clean energy, which is very good. But if you look at the y-axis, that's 12 terawatt hours of power to drive all of the apps that your phone interacts with. Um, and this is just a, a, a paper that we read as part of the class on how work for doing things like figuring out who your friends should be on Facebook or you know that kind of thing can actually migrate around the world depending on where it's sunny or where the wind is blowing. And I think that's a really interesting topic. So the, this is something that, that some of our students were really quite interested in. So what happens the last time you turn a device off? Uh, what is e-waste? What is the circular economy? For this, we relied a lot on the United Nations Environmental Program. They provided a number of resources such as the Global E-Waste Monitor uh, and a, a couple other publications that um, take an international look at this, especially looking at how different countries' policies and laws affect things like e-waste. In general, it's a huge issue. 53 megatons of e-waste is generated in 2019. You can see how it's spread across the world in this way. Only about 17%, a little over 17% of that is properly recycled. And about and over 80% of that ends up in streams that um, uh, often end up in landfills. And so while it's important to, to recycle, um, you know, trying to reduce the amount of this e-waste is really critical. And that was to that earlier point about mineral scarcity as well. E-waste has huge effects on people's health, uh, and this is kind of documented here. And so trying to come up with a way to make devices that are easier to take apart, easier to reconfigure, easier to keep in production reduces e-waste and, and is something that we should uh, strive to do. There's a documentary film called The Blame Gabe that we watched about a West African e-waste recycling center. And then we also, looked at some materials from Robert Boulard, who's the um, uh, Houston-based professor, the so-called father of environmental justice, who talked about um, environmental racism and environmental justice. Where does this e-waste go? Where does waste go? Where does pollution go? And uh, so we looked at, at um, this Christiana Amanpour interview uh, with Professor Boulard to talk in the context there of power plants, but it does work in concert with our discussion on, on, on e-waste. We talked about the role of public policy and governments in managing and mitigating these environmental effects. We had as a guest speaker, Bill Weil, he's the, or he was most recently the director of sustainability at Facebook. And before that, he was the green energy czar at Google. And he's currently the founder and executive director of Climate Voice, which is a company, which is a nonprofit that is lobbying tech companies to um, try to influence public policy and legislation focusing on climate change. So he has a 1.5 for 1.5 campaign that he talked about. We looked at some information provided by uh, AAAS on working with Congress, a scientist guide to policy so that students could actually prepare a one page proposal for a hypothetical meeting with a congressman to say, if you met with a congressman or someone in their staff and you had 10 minutes to talk about a technology related issue, how would you organize that ask, that one pager? We had two guest speakers, a panel of local and federal policymakers who came to class. Now this panel was spearheaded by Dr. Monica Stuft at the University of San Diego, included at the local layer, um, Mayor Serge Tadina from Imperial Beach, California, and then US Congressman Mike Levin, who's the representative for California's 49th Congressional District, which at the time included UC San Diego, uh, though I think I maybe they changed the boundary of that district uh, since then. And again, I think one of the key things that continued to be something that we wanted to focus on in this class was um, ensuring that students didn't just see the problem and feel despair, that they had some agency about how they would address the environmental impact of modern computing. And part of this was to write research papers so that they could understand a problem, propose solutions, and they put that one pager together on terms of doing policy, public policy advocacy. They culminated in video presentations that were part of that virtual poster session at the end as well. And these are all available online. So again, when we come back to this uh, spectrum idea, I think it's important that we sort of look at, at both 
uh, before the first page of our CS textbook and after that last page and incorporate that as conversations because it's important that people have a sense that um, design decisions that they make throughout their careers will have impact. I might be able to make something 20% faster, but you know maybe there's unintended effects that, that people haven't been thinking about. And so I don't want to spend too much time talking about the role networking research can play, but I'll take about five minutes or so, five or six minutes, just to talk a little bit about the work that we're doing at UCSD in this space. So I've talked about this relentless scale. If we just look at artificial intelligence, we started with CPUs, I talked about them before, to these GPUs that are used, special programmable logic devices focused on AI, finally special custom processors called Tensor Processing Units at Google focused on AI. You see this increasing demand for compute, and this has driven a demand on the networking side. We have this problem with all of those beautiful data centers I showed you with all of those hundreds of thousands of machines. How do you network them together in a way that can keep up with that bandwidth demand? It's a huge amount of demand. And building systems that can scale from 10 megabits in 1985 to a gigabit in the year 2000, 100 gigabits, 400 gigabits, a terabit a second, it's a huge problem. So these computers networks are getting faster. So back in maybe the year 2000, 2004, if every few years a new network technology would come out that would be 10 times faster. So it was keeping up with demand. And then around 2010 or so, that roadmap slowed down. We weren't getting 10x faster. We were getting like 4x faster. And then maybe five or six years would go by and then we get 2x faster. So this roadmap began slowing down. This is a diagram kind of showing Google's data center traffic, roughly speaking, growing year over year. And this is showing the speed that the network was increasing. And you see this gap here. This is the gap between the data demands that we have, the compute demands that we have, and what the network was capable of keeping up with. And so the way we've been able to bridge that gap, the way we've been able to meet these data processing and artificial intelligence demands has been by adding a lot more switches. So inside of a box, instead of taking one chip out and putting a new chip in that's 10 times faster, we would put lots and lots of slower chips in there to work together to try to keep up with that bandwidth demand. So you started seeing the number of these packet switches, these uh, network switches increasing, and, and they use up quite a bit of power, in fact. So more switches means more cost and power. That's these are some slides from some research presentations we did, but the point is that inside of these box, you're seeing a lot more of these very power hungry chips that rely on that supply chain that we talked about before. This is just quantifying that in a paper we recently published showing that the power is going in the wrong direction. The power to run our network is getting higher and that's a big problem. So a growing operational energy and embedded carbon burden on, our, on the network side. Furthermore, it turns out that for technical reasons, the way we build these networks is with fiber optic technology, and these use laser transmitters, a lot of them, uh, tens of thousands of them that have highly polluting components like gallium arsenide and others that have these huge environmental effects. So we want to figure out a way to address this at the network layer. So here at UCSD, uh, my colleagues and my students and I are taking a very old idea and bringing it forward to use in these networks. The idea is to get rid of most of those packet switches and most of those transceivers and replace them with what are called circuit switches. This is a picture showing a circuit switched telephone network where you they would literally connect calls together. We're gonna do that in the network really fast at the optical domain. And the idea is that we'll have fewer components and less power. Just to give you a quick sense of how that works, this is a cartoon picture showing that if we've got fiber optic communication, we can actually switch it by physically moving little mirrors inside of a device that cause that connection to go out of a different port. We're quickly changing ports, just like that telephone operator was changing ports, which means that when one computer needs to talk to another computer, we can quickly establish one of these paths and send it that way. So instead of having lots of these power hungry packet switches in between those two servers, we have what are effectively little tiny mirrors that don't use up hardly any power. So the research summary of our group is to redesign computer servers residing in data centers to interact with optical circuit switch networks instead of electronic packet switch networks 
and to design new types of optical switches specifically designed for data centers. So this cartoon picture that I showed you was designed for the telephone industry. Indeed, it was designed to help replace the legacy circuit switch network of the telephone network with the fiber optic deployment. Uh, but it turns out that's not actually very good for data center networks. And so we need something that can be more predictable and, uh, and, and lower power and a lot faster. So one of the things that we've been using is the idea is that instead of having mirrors that move with little motors under them, what we're instead gonna do is to take mirrors at different angles, put them on a disc and have a set of patterns. So you can think of it as the, you know, some computers can talk to each other in one pattern, different set of computers can talk to each other in a different pattern. And now if we shine our laser light on that disk and it's spinning around really fast, we're quickly cycling through all these different connection patterns. So we can sort of um, synchronize the computers talking with each other with these patterns that are being developed. And so this is a, a technology that we call a rotor switch that we've been developing. And this is what it looks like. This is a prototype that we have in our lab. What we did was we actually took some old hard drives we took the inside part out, we deposited some gold on it, and then we laser etched these different patterns onto it. And now when you turn on that drive and as it spins at 7,200 RPM, what it's really doing is spinning through all of these different little connection patterns so that computers can just wait their turn. And when the disc gets to the right part, the right little aspect, they can then do their communication at that point. These switches take a few watts of power, maybe 10 watts, whereas one of those larger packet switches I talked about maybe takes two kilowatts. So there's a huge difference in terms of um, power involved in that. And these don't require those laser trans transceivers that have um, some of those rare earth elements in them. And this is just showing some of the equipment here at UCSD that we've been uh, using to kind of look at that. So the idea is to basically cut down the amount of power in the network, for example. So um, I know there's a little bit of a, a whirlwind tour I wanted to keep uh, to time, but I think the kind of commonality between both of these aspects is that we very much want to build better systems, bigger systems, faster systems. It is a good thing that the global planetary compute demand is going up because it means we're doing things like AI driven vaccine discovery. We're doing things like um, coming up with ways of understanding the cell or understanding uh, physics, technology, fusion, energy, all these things require vast amounts of computing. So the, the idea that we have more computing and the idea that that's going up, that's a good thing. But we can't continue to build design systems or to teach students in a world where there is absolutely no re resource scarcity. We can't sort of teach students that they um, that it's not their problem to worry about where all this hardware comes from or where it goes in the future. And the hope is sort of that the interplay between the teaching and the research will try to help push um, students who design and build these systems to think a little bit more holistically about the kind of end-to-end -end effects of these systems that they're building. So with that, I'll, I'll turn things back over to George. And I just wanted to, again, thank you for being able to come here and, and share a little bit about what we've been doing here at UC San Diego. Mm -hmm.